in peace. Peace in our time. It's what we all want. Gina Torrey is going to tell us how we're going to make it with the Peace Research Institute. <laughs> Gina, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. It's a uh, pleasure to be here. Big responsibility, peace in our time. Is that what you do? Well, um, this is what we try to do. It's kind of like chipping away at a giant uh, iceberg, one you know, with our tiny ice pick. But uh, but the Peace Research Endowment uh, has uh, has been created to try to to make a, a bigger dent in that in that mm -hmm. big. Uh, if you would, because I'm sure that a lot of people haven't heard of the organization, so please tell us a little bit about the organization, its origin, and where it's based. Well, the Peace Research Endowment was founded um, in 2011. Uh, it was, it's been uh, created by a seed grant from the Peace Research Institute in Oslo, which is a world-class institute uh, researching peace and conflict. Um, and the endowment is based here uh, in, in the United States, but it's positioned globally. Uh, the endowment has been created to provide a bridge between academics uh, who are working on peace and conflict, studying mm -hmm. this, and policymakers. And you, you think, well, okay, this, this seems obvious, but academics tend to work in their own world, and policymakers tend to work in their own world, and sometimes they don't like each other. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, the endowment has been created as a catalyst to, uh, to, to ensure that, that, that good, solid, research on peace and conflict, whether it's being done academically or being done by policymakers, uh, is, being, um, is being used to affect change uh, on the ground. So it's being used to affect change in, in, in the real lives of people. So we're hoping that the endowment, uh, which has been seeded by, uh, by PRIO, uh, will continue to grow and to become a resource for those working on studying peace and conflict. Um, and we're hoping that this will connect, uh, will connect those academics, policymakers, so that better policy can be made. If I'm out there watching, the first thing I think of is, is well, academics, policymakers, neither one of them pick up guns and shoot people, or do they? Well, they don't, but they but they study they study the ways people pick up guns and shoot each other, <laughs> and uh, and sometimes they come to different conclusions, and sometimes uh, they have different data sets, and and oftentimes they're not in communication. So it is important that those who are mm -hmm. taking the time to do the quiet study it takes to get data on on peace and conflict. That that data is being transmitted to policymakers who are responsible for making uh, sometimes life and death decisions. Yeah, I, I can't think of anything better than working for for peace in our time. Um, how did you come to do this? Well, uh, I started uh, I started in this area uh, as the coordinator of something called the NGO Working Group on Women, Peace, and Security, which uh, is a women's peace uh, coalition international coalition based at UN headquarters that uh, pr that advocated for something called the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325. And for those of you who are not familiar with 1325, uh, this is the first time that the United Nations ever thought about, or at least the Security Council ever thought about, the impact of women in situations of conflict. Mm. And the unusual thing about this resolution is that it was women's civil society who pushed for the adoption of this resolution. And then this resolution did something completely extraordinary. Uh, she grew legs and she walked right out of the Security Council. So she was picked up by women building peace all over the world. Uh, and, uh, and so I was uh, lucky enough to become the coordinator of this working group in 2004. So I, I, spent, uh, I spent four years as the coordinator of this group. Uh, I've, I've then spent uh, several years working for the United Nations. Uh, most recently in the Department of Political Affairs Mediation Support Unit, where I was the department's expert on conflict-related sexual violence, uh, specializing in ceasefire and peace agreements mm -hmm. and the protection of civilians. And so this brings me up to, to today, where I've, I've become the executive director of the Peace Research Endowment. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to go off the grid then, off the grid of, of, of the, some of the questions well, that you I, can, that you I use the grid. <laughs> You can use the grid as well. <laughs> well I will, but, but I'm going off, yeah. off the grid because I have friends in the Eastern Congo. And uh, for years I'd been hearing that it was culturally acceptable for rape to happen. And then the more I dug into it with organizations based there, mm. I said, well, it's really not necessarily culturally acceptable. It just seems to be a weapon of violence. Is that accurate? It is. Uh, Conflict-related sexual violence is different from other types of sexual violence that occurs. Conflict-related sexual violence is a, t a tactic and method of conflict. It's used um, sometimes in place of a gun. It's inexpensive and it's incredibly effective and it is 
almost the tactic and method of choice for contemporary conflicts. You can look at the really? you, you can look at the Democratic Republic of Congo. You can look at what happened in Liber in in Liberia. You can ha look at what happened in Libya, in Syria, um, in in Yugoslavia, in World War II. Conflict-related sexual violence is a way to, for instance, displace populations from strategic centers. It's a way to prevent boys from joining opposition groups. It just doesn't happen to women. It also happens to men and boys, but they don't talk about it as frequently. Um, it's also used uh, in battles over sites of natural resources. And it's sometimes used like it was um, in Yugoslavia to, uh, to, change, uh, to try to change ethnicity. This just blows my mind that people could actually do such a, a horrible thing to each other and it'd be part of a strategy. Well, How do people come up with this stuff? Well, um, in today's conflicts, we, we don't have two standing armies anymore. We now, have civilian, we now have wars that are fought across the civilian population. And when you have wars that are fought across the civilian population, oftentimes these armed groups are not professional armies and they don't have access to conventional weaponry. Instead, uh, they, one of the easiest and most effective things to do is to use conflict-related sexual violence uh, because it has a lasting impact. Sometimes I say you can, you, can bomb, you can bomb a building and you can rebuild the building, mm -hmm. but it's difficult to do that to people's lives. So this kind of violence is something that is incredibly systemic and it has consequences for later on during the peace building process. So, you know, for example, uh, I've, had, uh, I've had women from the Liberian Women's Peace Movement talk to me about the rape they experienced during the war and the fact that uh, they have to live next to the, the, same, the same neighbor who raped them. And so for, for peace building, for long time, for long term peace building, not everyone, not everyone is brought to justice unfortunately, mm -hmm. and sometimes you end up living next to your perpetrator. And so the question is, how do, you, how do you prevent this kind of violence from taking place? And then how do you provide for ways to ensure that this kind of violence um, is, is addressed during the peace process and, uh, and further on in the peace building process? Um, I also have some friends in Sierra Leone, and I, and I watched what they did after their civil war ended, and it was incredibly violent. Uh, where and, and I don't understand going in and you, taking a machete and cutting off half of someone's arm. Mm. Um, why why would they do that? Well, it's a method and tactic of conflict, and I think that's an interesting point because we we think of wars as you know tanks and guns and uh, you know and and, arm and and helicopters and these kind of things. But in fact, there are methods and tactics that are used that are very strategic. Um, like conflict-related sexual violence that uh, that go under the radar of ceasefire and peace agreements. Mm -hmm. So one of the one of the things the United Nations has uh, has sought to um, to enhance in their peace building um, in their peace building work is how ceasefire and peace agreements are written. Because, for instance, these kind of methods and tactics, if you look at the actual content of ceasefire and peace agreements, they often provide rules for weapons and guns, but they don't provide rules for methods and tactics. And if you don't have rules for methods and tactics, then this can go on under the radar, uh, and it can continue with impunity. And it does. And it, and it does, like sexual violence, mm -hmm. for instance. And, and, that's, and that's one of the reasons, for instance, why research on peace and security is, is so needed. And I can give you one example of okay. this. Um, the, the United Nations has produced something called Guidance for Mediators in Addressing Sexual Violence and Ceasefire and Peace Agreements. And this was a collaborative effort that was a research effort, in fact. And this research effort uh, took about a year and a half, two years, to, to, to really come to fruition. But it's provided guidance for mediators on how you might address conflict-related sexual violence in ceasefire and peace agreements. And this research has been used now in two ceasefire agreements. Mm -hmm. The first is the, the recent ceasefire agreement that was signed in the Central African Republic. And the second is a ceasefire agreement that was signed uh, in Mali. But before that, if you can imagine, in the entire history of the world, and the entire history of ceasefire agreements, the word sexual violence only appeared three times. And it was never monitored for. Mm. So this points to one of the benefits of 
having research that has a direct policy link, so it has a relationship with those who are responsible for trying to implement uh, or write, for instance, in this case, ceasefire and peace agreements. And it seems small, the fa it, se it seems small to find the nugget, this is research, yeah. to find the nugget that only three ceasefire agreements in the history of ceasefires ever had the word sexual violence. But using that, people were, s were shocked. People thought, well, this, is, this, ha this has happened in almost every war that we can think of. They were shocked at the fact that, in fact, the, the rules that govern the peace process hadn't actually addressed it. Could it be that it's um, men have controlled things for, uh, for all of these years and then finally uh, uh, women are getting more of a voice? Well, I think that, unfortunately, uh, those who sit around the peace table are those who, uh, who are mediating the peace, uh, who are usually men, and those who have uh, picked up the guns who are usually men. And so women who are largely there doing the hardest work of keeping their families and communities together um, don't get a place at, at the peace table. Uh, there, the United Nations has a statistic that uh, I think less than 2% of all signatories to peace agreements have been women. Mm -hmm. So women categorically do not sit around the table. And sometimes when they do, um, it's not always a given that that women are going to represent women's interests. Uh, there, there are there are ceasefire and peace agreements that have that have a, a female signatory to it, that are not very gender friendly. So I think the women have now a bit more of a voice when it comes to when it comes to peace processes, but uh, but huge progress has not yet been made. For instance, mm -hmm. the international community has not been able to effectively pre-position women inside of a transition process. And we have an opportunity when it comes to Syria to, to take, there is a Syrian women's peace movement. Uh, and we do have an opportunity uh, if, if those who are in charge of the mediation process uh, will open it up to pre-position women inside of an eventual transition and, an, and, and as part of the mediation process. My entire life, there has been a discussion of peace in the Middle East. And the fact of the matter is, is that I think for everyone's entire lives, that's been a discussion. Everyone who's alive on the planet today and probably for the last 2,000 years. A dumb question, but will there ever be peace in the Middle East? Or I guess the better question is, is what will it take? Well, uh, that's, uh, that's a great question. And I, I think that's a question that a lot of mediators and, and, and have, have, tried to, have tried to figure out. Mm -hmm. But I do think that it's important to, to have the kinds of research on, on issues because the, the peace, pro peace processes, aren't, they change over time. And oftentimes we don't capture best practice. We don't capture good practices. There are people who are working in the field for years who have no space to, for instance, download the information that they have, they have learned firsthand. Oftentimes people who are active, you know, maybe you've spent seven years working in Afghanistan uh, mm -hmm. or you've been in the Central African Republic for five years. You've seen and experienced things and you know things that most people do not. These people, these kinds of people won't maybe go and do a PhD and there might not be space for them. And one of the things that the Peace Research Endowment is uh, positioned to, to do is, is, to, is to fund those kinds of individuals who, um, who have this experience uh, and need a chance or, or an opportunity to download it into um, in, into a kind of research topic so that it can be used by policymakers because so often there and you, you know the statistic that every mm. five years that sometimes uh, you, countries will relapse into conflict every five years I think it is the case that often best practice and experience isn't captured uh, as well mm. as it could be you know it sounds like um, certainly we've talked about conflict being cultural, mm. but it sounds like that peace is cultural too. Well, I think peace is cultural um, and, uh, and it can evolve and change over time. Um, but I don't think that, I, I don't think that conflict is, is inherent to any particular culture. Um, just like just like peace isn't inherent to any particular culture, it's something that uh, that evolves and changes, and mm -hmm. we work on over time. Are men and women impacted differently by war? They are. They they certainly are impacted differently by war. Um, 
as we, as we talked about earlier, uh, women uh, are often the ones keeping their families and communities together. And when it comes to, to brokering peace, they, they don't get a seat at the table. And, and, and oftentimes their needs uh, are, left, are left out of the equation. Mm -hmm. When you're leaving out, not that including women is a panacea to peace, but if you're leaving out 50% of the population, then you know, you've, uh, your chances are diminished. Uh, the other uh, the other ways that that war impacts men and women differently is you know we have to remember that women also pick up guns to fight, and sometimes they are conscripted into armed groups in a way um, that renders them sometimes invisible. Sometimes they are uh, c they join armed groups because they're forced to as sex slaves, or they're forced wives, or they're cooks, or they've been kidnapped into the group. And sometimes when uh, when peacetime comes and everybody is 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 giving up their guns. Oftentimes, in programs, and this is now beginning to change, you, it's the men who have the guns who have access to the programs. And the women who have been part of these groups, whether they've been fighters, there were women in Nepal, uh, Maoist fighters, who were part of the, who were part of the army. Um, again, thinking about how, uh, how we are, what we, we use this term, you know, demobilizing, how we are demobilizing these, uh, both men and women. Uh, an American ambassador, Donald Steinberg, tells a great story about his experience as ambassador in Angola uh, many years ago when, uh, during the, the disarmament process. He was very happy because uh, they had given all of the men who uh, were in the armed groups uh, f funds in exchange for their gun and sent them back to their communities. However, as he tells in, in this story, they didn't think about the fact that the men were going back to communities where things had changed. The women had taken over, and mm -hmm. they were going to back to places where, where things were not the same as they were when they had left, and this created a lot of d domestic violence. And so giving, you know, giving, men, giving men, men money in exchange for guns isn't, uh, wasn't the, exactly the solution, and, and maybe, maybe one to think about the ways in which uh, men need to go back into, into their communities, go back uh, to, you know, to, to married life or, or into, you know, mm. into wider spaces. There's a great question on the uh, PRIO website. Mm. And you know, I looked at it and I thought, okay. I said, you know, this is obvious. And then I looked at it again and I said, no, it's not. And, and the question is, is why do wars break out? Again, another great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, in 1941, Franklin D. Roosevelt, uh, in a s speech to the State of the Union, came up with, uh, with, with four uh, human freedoms. Uh, freedom, uh, freedom of speech, freedom uh, of worship, freedom from fear, and freedom from want. And his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, took that to the United Nations, where those, those four freedoms form the principle of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the UN, um, still today, their definition of human freedom is uh, freedom, from, freedom from fear and freedom from want. And wars break out um, for a lack of those freedoms, for reasons related to poverty, reasons related to access and control of resources reasons related to political and uh, religious persecution. And it's, 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 it's not an easy question to solve. How are wars sustained? Another question from your website, and it's a great one. How are wars sustained? Because when I look at sustained, I look at how do they get funded? Very true. So how are wars sustained and how do they get mediated? And how, and how effective is the mediation? And, and that brings us back to the question of um, how do you ensure that during a, during a peace process, mediators and those who are involved in helping to broker peace have the kind of information that they need uh, to, to make good decisions, to make sound decisions? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes data is missing, so we talked about sexual violence earlier. If in the case of Libya, for instance, it was very difficult at the beginning to ascertain if sexual conflict-related sexual violence was occurring. And immediate research was needed, in fact, to, to be able to, to, to get some idea so that some information could be passed on to, to those who were in charge of the mediation process. So, so effectively, having, having better uh, research that's linked directly to, um, to helping policymakers, helping uh, those, those who are inside of mediation processes, uh, it, again, chipping away at the, mm. at the giant iceberg. And that's what the endowment does. 
And that's what the endowment is now positioned to do. Uh, we, we're hoping that, uh, that this will be uh, a fund that will be a catalyst for, for change, a catalyst for action, and a catalyst for, for connecting uh, the academic world with the policy world and these two, and these two worlds who, who, don't, who don't necessarily talk to each other or have relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, we're hoping that the fund can act as a catalyst for, uh, for forging those kind of relationships that will eventually yield uh, better, better action and better results. As we sit here today, it's uh, September the 25th, 2013 at mm -hmm. the Clinton Global Initiative. Uh, there are conflicts in lots of places. But I'm not sure that anyone would call them a war. Uh, just mm -hmm. recently we had uh, bombings at, uh, at, at a mall in Kenya. Yeah. But there were other uh, violent acts uh, yeah. that are, weren't quite as, as heavily yeah. reported. And then, of course, there's the Syria situation. Mm -hmm. Can you lump them into one and come up with a solution? Or are, are each of them individual incidents? Or just how do you do this? Well, I think th I think that's that's a very challenging question about uh, about where where are early warning signs, and to to what extent do we um, do we consider one incident over the other, and and who's studying that? So who's mm -hmm. watching out for that, and mm -hmm. who's alerting everybody? And and again, um, again, pointing to the need for for for, for better, faster, uh, more efficient research. Mm -hmm. Is that, and that's what the researchers are doing, or what kind of information do they need to be able to come up with some recommendations to policymakers? What kind of information do they need? Well, I think it's that, that's I think it's completely dependent on uh, on on what the what the issue is, in fact. Uh, but uh, but we're hoping. Yeah, I haven't figured that one. Out, wait, what the but, issue is? But we're hoping <laughs> the endowment will be able to to provide uh, to provide funding for uh, for everyone from. Uh, from those working at a high level of mediation, such as the United Nations or the African Union, or mm -hmm. you know anybody working at the kind of global level, international institutions, regional institutions, to uh, to, to people who are studying very small, um, rather what's considered to be small issues uh, or or understudied issues. Mm -hmm. So from the individual researcher um, up and up to the the larger. Well, you certainly have taken on the most difficult issue of our time, and so I'm going to ask you to look ahead five years. Mm -hmm. And if you were to come back and sit in the chair uh, five years from now, and I would ask you, you know, how you've done, what do you think you'd say? Mm. Well, you know, I, I'm, I hope that uh, I hope that we have have built a fund that is able to make an impact, uh, even if it's very small, inside of at least at least ten different peace processes ongoing, whether they be uh, large or um, or something smaller. Because as we know, there are there are lots of small conflicts that are ongoing that uh, that fall under the radar. Gina, thank you very much for thank being you. with us right here on Rainmaker. Thanks very much for having me. Rainmaker believes we can change the world. One life, one heart, one soul, one mind.